First of all, I would, I would like to congratulate the organizer of this event for such a for having such an impressive lineup of speakers as well as such a diverse audience as you have introduced, which is very impressive given that it's actually organized as quite a short turnaround time. I think I was only contacted uh, maybe two months ago or two or three months ago. So, and um, I'm also very honored to be part of this uh, exciting event. So I actually look forward to the next two days of intense and intellectually stimulating conversations with the audience. And okay, so for the next 45 minutes or so, I will be introducing about big data forensics and some of the potential research um, that needs to be addressed. So where do I point this? Okay, fantastic, thank you. So I don't think we, I need to introduce what is, or define what is big data or uh, I mean, at, at this stage, because I believe there are many, many of you who actually work in this in, in this room who are actually working in this area, in this area. But how many of us have actually come across the term big forensic data or big data forensics? Okay, one, two, not many hands. I think big big forensic data or big data forensics they mean quite a different thing. They are actually very new. For example, let us go around this room and see how many sources of digital data uh, can we identify. Some of us maybe. Would, most of you will be having at least one or more mobile devices. Some of us might be having smart, smart uh, Fitbit or other uh, devices on you. They actually have some sort of digital connect connection. Okay, as compared to, okay, so when it comes to big data, I'm, okay, this is the world that we live in. For example, five years ago, if I'm going to ask this, if I, if I were to ask this question, the number of devices that we have on our body will be actually much less. So what does it mean for when it comes to forensic investigation? Five years ago or 10 years ago, when we want to conduct forensic investigation, all we have to do is just to get a court warrant, or, uh, a court warrant go to the place, seize the hardware, for example, the routers or the computers, the mobile devices, and that's it. But these days, if we go to a crime scene, we, we, do, not have just, we do not worry only about the routers, the hard disk or the uh, computers. We have to look at the things around us. What are the things that can actually uh, contain evidence, potential sources of evidence? For example, this room doesn't have the uh, biometric access control, but for some officers, they actually have a biometric um, access control. For those are actually sources of digital data as well that we need to collect as digital forensic experts or digital forensic practitioners. So in other words, digital evidence is no longer restricted to devices such as computers, laptops, and mobile devices. If, even though mobile devices are currently the most common sources of digital evidence when it comes to uh, criminal investigation. And I assume that for those who are working in forensic in the private sector, I assume that this is still the case in the commercial setting as well. And please correct me if I'm wrong. And also increasingly, a number of our consumer devices at home are actually capable of storing and processing digital data. For example, smart fridge, smart TV. Some of us might actually have it at our home. Those devices can also contain uh, digital data. I think just two or three years, just two years ago, there was actually a news, there was a news report that our smart TV was actually compromised to uh, send spams to add as botnets. And five years ago, if I were to stand here and say, look, our smart TV, your TV at home may be used to send spams, I don't think anyone would believe me, right? So things have changed. So increasingly, uh, this is a world that we live in. So today, I will actually focus my discussion on two of the most common evidential sources in forensic investigations that are related to big data, namely cloud computing and smart mobile devices. Earlier when I asked whether how many of you have heard of the term big data forensic or big forensic data, I saw a few hands. Okay, what is, big, what is uh, digital forensic to most of you? And you want to try? What is digital forensic if your students or if someone on the street were to ask you, what is digital forensic? What will your answer be? Can someone here help me out? Yes? Well, Sorry? Sort of complete collection. Uh, computer forensics, network forensics, software forensics. Yes, but what does that involve? Thank you. So Oops, it's, it's connected to uh, a law enforcement, uh, cyber crime, uh, data, evidence collection. Okay, evidence collection. Any, anyone want to try it? Any other answers? Yes? Process and analyze and uh, documenting. Fantastic. So what the three of you have mentioned actually captured the, the essence of digital forensic. I usually ask this question because I'm actually teaching digital forensic in my class as well to both postgrad and undergrads. So I usually ask, this is one of the first questions that I ask during my course. And most of them I say, I know why it's digital forensic because I've watched CSI Cyber or I have watched NCIS. <laughs> 
in a way, yes, that's digital forensic. I'm, I'm going to introduce what's digital forensic in a moment. But what the three of you, Rob and the two gentlemen, has, has, have mentioned, I actually captured the extent of digital forensic. And also, interesting, I think the gentleman over there mentioned about law enforcement and government. This is also one of the most common comments that I receive from students or anyone that I speak to when they say, when they ask, what are you working in? I say, I'm working on forensic research. They say, oh, it must be with the government or, or police which is not true. Even though forensic has its roots, especially traditional forensic sciences, they have its roots with law enforcement or government, but digital forensic is not just with um, the police or governments. In fact, one of my PhD students, he, before he finished his PhD, he's now still, uh, he's almost finishing his PhD, he just got a job with KPMG in Sydney, Australia, as a forensic consultant. And in fact, if you look at most of the big force like KPMG, Deloitte, Ernest & Young, PricewaterhouseCoopers, most of them actually have a digital forensic section or e-discovery, electronic discovery section. So digital forensic is no longer just restricted to governments or law enforcement. It is increasingly so in private sectors. Okay, am I speaking too fast? No? Okay, thank you. There are many disciplines of forensic science, as I mentioned. I mean, traditional forensic, you'll be familiar with, be DNA forensic, ballistics, blood forensics, and so on. So digital forensic is actually one of the newest key on the block for forensic sciences. And <coughs> digital forensic is the discipline that is used for the acquisition and analysis of digital evidence, as what uh, the two gentlemen have mentioned. However, compared to, digital, to other forensic sciences, digital forensic is actually very new. Thank you. So, okay, there are many definitions of digital forensic. I'm just going to use this as one of the most common definitions, at least used in Australia by the, law, by the Australian law enforcement agencies. So, digital forensic is the process of identifying, preserving, analyzing, and presenting digital evidence in the court of law that is legally acceptable. I think what the three gentlemen mentioned over earlier was actually about identifying, preserving, and analyzing. I mean, in, that is what is usually associated with digital forensic. But the last stage is always, uh, is usually uh, forgotten about presenting. So once we have collected the digital evidence in the report, so what do we do with the report? Or what do we do with the evidence? Not yet. So what do we do with the evidence? We have to present in court, whether as an expert witness or pass it over to the investigator who then have to actually explain it to a jury. So digital forensic, there are four key steps. So what you see in, on TV, for example, NCIS or CSI cyber is usually analyzed preservation and analysis. So they preserve and then they analyze. Yep. Sorry. Okay, so when it comes to identification, it mostly relates to the physical identification of devices in electronic devices. I mean, that actually contain potential uh, data of uh, interest. Where, for example, in, in most traditional cases, would be your PCs, your phones, smart cards. I mean, in, I mean now you might even be talking about your smartwatch or your Google Glasses, or anything that's connected on you. I think many years ago, uh, was it five, four or five years ago, there was a news article that the US, uh, US as Vice President, he actually disabled the wireless feature in his pacemaker because he was worried that uh, his pacemaker can be actually exploited to, uh, to, to assassinate him. So increasingly, medical devices are something that we are looking at, Inter uh, wireless devices, uh, Internet of Things, and so on, because all these can actually be exploited to conduct cyber attacks. So, and another thing I've, I forgot to mention is, digital forensic, I mean, even though digital forensic is usually um, used in, case, in cyber crime cases, but it's not just used in cyber crime cases. It can be used in cases involving traditional crimes such as homicide and serious and organized crime. I think one of the lady that I spoke to earlier, she mentioned that, um, correct me if, if I interpret that wrongly, what, I mean, the, the, top, the top three priorities by Canadian um, forensic practitioners, I mean, at least those in governments are, um, child porn, terrorism, and also uh, homicide, right? If, that's the same in Australia. The top three priorities for us would be, uh, at least for the federal police, would be ter terrorism, child porn, and serious and organized crime. And in most cases, serious and organized crime include not just cyber crimes, but also drug trafficking, human trafficking. And because increasingly they're actually using digital devices, they actually require digital forensic as well. So the second step is preservation. So once we have identified the devices, for example, whether it's a laptop or your Fitbit or your Google Glass or your smart card, so what do we do with them? We have to make sure that we preserve the evidence. So preservation in this case means that we try not to make any changes to the original data source. Uh, I mean, in most cases, we use a standard imaging tool, which actually takes as image, uh, uh, an image of a disk, and then we use compression 
and then, and then we use some sort of, um, I mean, there, there are two ways of uh, acquiring the image. It can be a physical acquisition or logical acquisition, which I'm not going into details, but for those who work in the area who know me, you know these two terms. And once we have actually preserved this, we have to make sure that the technique that we use or the tool that we use are actually forensically sound. And what does that mean? Actually, varies depending on what jurisdiction you work in, because forensic is, uh, is an interdisciplinary subject. It actually involves, I mean, it's not just computer science or engineering. It actually involves the legal side of things as well. Because the tools, the technique that you use, have to make, you have to ensure that they're actually uh, compliance with the local law, the Local Evidence Act. So, so when it comes to preservation, you have to ensure that the techniques that you use are uh, forensically sound. So once you have done that, you have to do the analysis. So basically, analysis is what most of us would think that this is the hardcore digital forensic. This is what you, I mean, you analyze, it, you integrate, you, 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 you examine the, the data and get the useful bits out of it. And once you have done that, as I mentioned, you have to present the court, the evidence in the court of law. So these are the four, four key steps of digital forensics. Thank you. So when we start, when I start working on the, uh, cloud fronts, uh, digital forensics five years ago, we were not looking at big data forensics then because big data forensics back then was not known. I mean, big data was uh, starting to get popular about five years ago. But five years ago, there were a lot, there were a number of papers that were actually, um, I think there were about less than 10 papers, a, a small number of papers that were actually mentioning about cloud forensics and in terms of how cloud computing is going to complicate efforts to um, collect evidence. What do, what do I mean by that? It used to be a case, as mentioned earlier, the, the, the data actually result on your computer or on your mobile devices. So if I'm interested in those, it's in a suspect, uh, all I have to do is just to get a court warrant and go to the suspect's place and seize all the hardware, all, all the storage devices. But when it comes to cloud computing, this uh, model doesn't work anymore. Why? Because even though if I go to seize the hardware, whether it's the mobile phone or the hard disk or the computers, the data is not going to be locally stored in most cases. It's going to be somewhere in the cloud. For us who are based in Australia, the cloud services are most likely not going to be in Australia. That means we have a jurisdictional issue. So that is going to complicate, that's going to complicate uh, uh, for, um, evidence collection. And I think when, when, we, were start look, when we start looking at uh, this topic five, uh, five years ago, there were a number of small papers as mentioned earlier, but most of them are just saying that, okay, this is going to be a problem but no one was actually offering a solution, a technical solution back then. So we were actually one of the first group to actually start looking at what type of evidence that actually remain on the devices that can actually help us to reconstruct part of the events or help us to build the bigger picture or so that we can actually go a step further and try to collect the data required from a cloud service provider. So in, a, in addition, as you are aware, when it comes to cloud, cloud is an umbrella term. There are so many type of services. There's PWAS, IWAS, SWAS, and different services, different cloud models. They have different um, ways of doing things. I mean, in, in terms of trying to collect data, it's actually quite different as well as what we found from mechanical experiments. Even for SWAS, trying to collect data from, say, uh, OneDrive, or and trying to collect data from own cloud would be quite different for the matter. So, uh, and also what we found was during, during the research is that many of the existing cloud forensic models and techniques, they actually, they actually have this assumption that we need physical access to the storage media that actually holds the device. Clearly this assumption does, doesn't hold when it comes to cloud forensics. So when we, we actually do a literature review, I mean the first step we, we did was actually we do a literature review, but we, we pretty much give up very quickly because there were less than 10 papers in five years ago. So less than 10 papers, you couldn't really do a, a review. But what we did was we actually do a review of uh, the forensic models that were out there the traditional digital, uh, digital forensic and computer forensics, as well as network forensic models, and we found that most of these most of these models actually have a limitation because they actually require physical access to the storage media. So we come up with the first. Thank you. We actually come come up with. Oh, I think I skipped. Okay. So we actually come up with one of the first uh, forensic uh, cloud forensic model. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we actually undertook a series of technical experiments on a range of um, cloud devices as well as cloud servers. So for example, uh, okay, there, there are two sides. I think we actually conducted a, a number of experience on both public clouds and private clouds. So when it comes to public clouds, we were only uh, doing client devices analysis. So when it comes to client devices analysis, we are interested to know if I have access to a mobile device that have been used to access a uh, Google Drive, OneDrive. So what sort of data actually remain on your devices? How can I actually get access to other to data that's stored in the cloud? Simply by just having the device that was used to access cloud. 
without having access to a cloud service provider. So that's actually one of the key, key questions that we want to answer when it comes to uh, pub public cloud for forensics. We also do private cloud forensics. So in the sense that we actually have a have a cloud, a, a mini cloud server uh, uh, in our lab. So we actually install the full, we actually have a full installation of the um, own cloud and other private cloud solution. We did both client and server analysis. So, so that we can have a good understanding of, and in-depth understanding of what data can we actually recover from both client devices as well as client servers, I'm mean, sorry, cloud servers. Okay. Um, yep. So can I move? Okay. So rather than reinventing the view, we actually integrate two of the most widely used forensic models. I mean, that was in 2012. So quite, eh, sorry. So our first model was actually step two to step five. So that was actually the first that was actually the first model that we used. We actually used the first model, the step two to step five, to uh, validate, to actually conduct a number of experiments uh, involving both public and private clouds. And 2013, one of my other students actually decided to extend the model. So what we end up with, this is our second model, so we actually have a six step model. We I mean using this model, which I'm going to run through later. Okay, so, so the first stage, the first phase is pretty self-explanatory. So we basically determine the scope of our investigation. For example, is this a child point investigation? Is this a terrorism investigation? Or is this a national security investigation? Because different cases or different nature actually require different resources, different expertise, and different tools. For example, when it comes to child porn, there'll be a lot of, uh, there'll be a lot of um, images and videos. So we need dedicated tools or storage just for that. But when it comes to terrorism, there'll be a different, uh, different nature, different resources that we need. So, and the second phase is concerned with establishing the evidence available and also its format in order to establish the best practice for retrieval of digital evidence. So when it comes to cloud services, for example, different cloud service providers, they, they may use different proprietary formats or protocols. So we actually need to determine the best tools that we use to actually be able to recover some of this evidence, whether we actually need to do a live acquisition or not. And I will not go through the rest of the slides in the interest of time, so I'm just going to skip to the next. So in the, in the initial phase of our research, we actually focused on three widely used cloud storage services, Dropbox, SkyDrive, and Google Drive. I'm sure many of us in this room have actually used these services at some stage, or you are still using it now. As well as a private uh, open source cloud solution, uh, own cloud, which is in the next slide. So we were actually able to, I mean, our experiments, we were actually able to uh, forensically recover username and password. So what is interesting about this is, if I have access to your mobile device or your laptop, they have been used to access these uh, services, whether it's through an app or through uh, a website, we are actually able to recover a, a wide range of information, including your username and password. So once we are able to recover your, say, your Dropbox username and password, pretty much you'll be able to log in as you to download all your data. I mean, it, that, this research was about uh, three years ago now. So in more recent times, we actually re revisit our experiment involving Dropbox and Google Drive. We found that they have moved away from using username and password on your device. They actually moved to uh, OAuth authentication scheme, O-A-U-T-H. And even though they moved to OAuth authentication scheme, we are still able to recover or intercept the authentication token as well as a refresh token on your device. Again, once we have that, we'll be basically able to log in as you and download the data. So this is what we found. And we were also uh, trying to see whether any, whether existing anti-forensic techniques actually works. For example, D-Band, Eraser, CC Cleaner. Any one of you have actually used that before? Okay. How effective do you think those are? Yes, no? Somewhat? Somewhat? Okay. In fact, we found that even if you use uh, CC Cleaner or D-Band, sorry, uh, Eraser or CD Cleaner, we could still recover a wide range of information. Less information, but it's still very useful information, including your username and password. So that's the most interesting part. I mean, that's one of the things that we are very interested in, your username and password. But when it comes to D-Band, um, pretty much uh, this is, is rather effective because it actually wipes the operating system. You could still recover, but the information you recover are pretty uh, meaningless in most cases. So that, that was actually what we found for our technical experiments involving those three cloud services. And then we move on to own cloud. And again, for own cloud, I mean, some, how many of us actually have used own cloud before? Okay, good. Own cloud is, is, is actually quite popular in Australia. In fact, for our, um, there's a, there's a, in, in Australia, there's a network called ARNET, A-A-R-N-E-T. So if you do a Google search, you'll be able to find it. It's actually an Australian academic research network. So it's actually built based on own cloud. 
So basically, all the universities in Australia and New Zealand, we are using Arnet. So OwnCloud is actually very popular, at least in the part of the world that I'm living in. So we actually uh, do uh, we actually uh, investigate the OwnCloud installation that was the most recent at the at the time of research, and we I mean our experiment were, were more exploratory in nature. So we want to we want to understand if we are go if we actually go into a in, into a data center that actually run own cloud, what data are we able to recover from both the client devices as well as the server so, uh, as well as a cloud servers? Remember earlier in the in the tree, in the earlier slides when I mentioned about. Um, Google Drive, Dropbox, and OneDrive, we will actually do only client analysis because we do not have access to the cloud servers. So in this case, we actually have access to the cloud servers. And on the client analysis, we were actually able to recover a wide range of information, as what you have seen on the slide. And also in the server, again, we were also able to recover a range of information, but it's going to be quite expensive to recover the entire cloud storage instance, depending on how big the instance is. That's what we found. In terms Expensive in terms of a resource and in terms of the time that you need to spend on yes. So you're recovering this information without actually having administrator access to the systems. For this one, yeah, we need to have administrator access. Why can't you recover everything? Uh, it, 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 okay, it it really depends on on the settings because in these cases we are actually as pro, we are actually uh, having the most stringent setting the most secure setting trying to say, okay, administrator access, but administrator have limited access in, in the sense that, um, okay, because what we want to model, what we want to model in this scenario is the administrator is not going to be able to have access or 100% access to all the client, client data. They only have, they're only going to have uh, selected privileges, if, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we are trying to have, in this case, we are trying to model the most stringent administrator, um, administrator rights and then try to see what data can be actually recovered. Okay, I hope I have answered your question. Yep, thank you. So again, this actually has pri uh, privacy. Uh, okay, we actually explore a range of scenarios. That is actually the, the most stringent scenario. We also try to explore scenarios whether we whether we are actually able to recover data that belongs to other clients, if we have actually access to the to the to the server. Actually, because as as you are, as you are aware, because of uh, multi tenancy, so the, the the server actually stores data from different clients. So we want to understand that if we actually have access to the data, but can we actually recover data belonging to other clients or other instances? And we found that we were actually able to. So this actually has privacy uh, implications as well, especially if this is actually this was done in the EU or a jurisdiction that's more stringent privacy <coughs> requirements. The next slide, please. So we actually. The, the, the findings were actually detailed in our book published two years ago, which is also again the first academic book on this topic. So we were quite fortunate that we actually have the chief defense scientist of Australia writing the foreword for us, and also his law enforcement counterpart, which is the, um, the chairs of the electronic evidence specialist group. So as I mentioned earlier, this work was actually about three years old now. So since then, we have also studied newer cloud storage versions, as well as social networking sites and other uh, popular app uh, categories using the framework that I show. So the frame, usually in our research, we use the, the, the condensed framework, which is the four step, the step two, the step five, if you can recall on my earlier slide. And not surprisingly, we were actually able to recover more or less information, more or less the same type of information, such as cache or offline files, store on the device, internet, and external storage, as well as data in transit. Data in transit is also very interesting to us. For example, we were actually able to recover file metadata on the internal storage in the SQL-like database, such as username and password. And also, as I mentioned earlier, many of these apps or services, they have moved on to use OAuth authentication scheme. Again, we are able to recover the authentication token and refresh token in many of these apps. So once we recover that, we pretty much know what we, have, what we can do. So, some of the potential gaps is how many of us here in this room have lost or have our mobile devices stolen or misplaced in the last 12 months or last 24 months? In fact, I have, I have lost my, my own device achieved uh, about two or three years ago on, on the flight back to uh, Australia. I lost it on the flight and I couldn't find it. So I'm sure, I'm sure you, I mean, because this is a room full of security professionals and researchers, I'm sure you do not need any convincing that your mobile device is actually the key to your kingdom, in a sense, because that's data. Because this day's data is actually gold. So what, and how many of us actually have used a remote wiping app or re remote wiping features on your phone? Yes, how useful do you think that is? It was good to reset it, but I'm not sure, as far as forensically, I'm not sure. Okay, any, any, other, any other person? No? 
So when I lost my phone about two years ago, that actually set me thinking. I actually removed my phone. So I was thinking, how useful is that if someone is able to recover, is, if someone actually has access to my phone and has access to forensic tools, is my data secure? <laughs> so that actually sets me a question. So that incident actually is helpful in a sense because it kind of, oh, okay, it kind of set me thinking. So again, because usually when it comes to doing research, one of the first things that we do is to do a literature review. And we found that, surprisingly, there are not many papers out there again. This, uh, when it comes to remote wiping and serve, um, remote wiping and so on, we find that it's actually an understudy topic. So in this paper, in this research, actually I got one of my students to do a literature review together. So we actually found that, first, first of all, there are not many papers. And so if there are not many papers, we can't really do a literature review in that sense. So I got him to actually examine some of the patents as well. Because for those of you working in academia, you know that in most literature survey, you do not survey patents. patents. So in, in, in this literature review, we survey both papers and patents in, in the area, trying to understand what is the state of art when it comes to uh, remote wiping uh, secure edition. And let me see why, I, okay. And I mean, as, I mean so in, in this research, we found that there are actually more patents than published papers, which is somewhat surprising. And then we also conduct some, of, some technical experiments on a number of Android devices. And we found that the, the results actually vary between devices and also the types of forensic tools we have access to. To answer your question, some of the remote wiping are actually quite, I mean, some of the remote wiping are actually quite useful. For example, depending on what devices or what apps they are using, for example, if, if, the, if the drive is encrypted, if you actually erase the key and without access to the key, you can't actually recover that using standard forensic tools. So what we found that is the, the, res, the, the effectiveness of the remote wiping features and the apps are actually vary. It depends on the devices and it also depends on the versions that you're running on. So the, it's, quite, it's actually quite interesting. So we also identified a number of research gaps, including the need to actually provide mes message confidentiality using encryption and also ensuring that the wiping process cannot be interrupted. Because one of the things that we found is some of the wiping process can actually be interrupted. For example, if I issue a remote wipe to my device, I actually, for some of them, we can actually intercept the, the, the command so that the device never receives the command. So if the re device never receives a command, the device will not, the data will not be wiped. So this is actually one of the things that one uh, that needs to be looked at. And also the need for comprehensive evaluations on the security and effectiveness based on real-world implementations. As because how, how one of the things that we found is there are most of these papers, they do not have any uh, real-world evaluations. In most of the, I mean, in the small number of papers that we found, most of them are actually conducted in a lab, in a very uh, simulated environment. So these are some of the research gaps that, that we found when it comes to secure uh, deletion and remote wiping. And also based on the work that we described in the previous slide, we actually adapt the adversary model uh, from the computer security literature and publish the first adversary model for forensic investigation. So for those of you here who are working in security or crypto, you might be familiar with adversary model. So adversary model is basically a mathematical model that actually defines what an adversary or an attacker can do or cannot do. So what we found that this is somewhat similar to a forensic investigator because a forensic investigator is somewhat can be considered an attacker. So the, this forensic investigator is actually interested in your data. So we, and okay, sorry, can you move to the next slide? Sorry. Okay. So in this, uh, in this work, we actually propose, we actually um, define what a forensic investigator can do or cannot do within this, uh, say, a, it's a scenario. So a forensic investigator can actually delete some data, can actually encrypt or decrypt can actually exploit, make a forensic copy. As I mentioned earlier, forensic copy can be both logical and physical uh, copy. Can do a forensic investigation, can inject some messages into the forensic copy. I think I should also mention that, that for forensic investigation, we do not deal with the original copy. We always make a forensic copy of the data, and then we actually do our investigation on the forensic copy itself. And also we can modify transmit Edison. So in, in this, um, so for this work, can, can we move the next slide? So using this forensic copy, uh, this uh, adversary model, we actually con construct the first uh, uh, adversary model methodology for Android devices. We actually use this technique to help us investigate uh, a number of Android devices on the number of uh, cloud storage apps. And, we've, and you see, okay, we actually compare our method against those in the literature, and we found that some of the techniques in the literature, they actually requires the Android device to be rooted. So, 
and I'm sure, I mean, router is similar to your uh, geo-breaking your iPhone. Once you have done that, you actually, you might be changing some of the data in, on your device. So this is against forensic soundness. We, we try to avoid that if wherever possible. And also, it doesn't require the recovery boot partition to be fresh. This is for Android devices. Whereas most of the techniques in the literature, they actually required the boot partition to be fresh or the recovery partition to be fresh. And also, we are able to collect a bit for bit physical copy. So physical copy, okay, the difference between a logical copy and a physical copy is physical copy is actually a bit for bit copy. It takes much more time, but it actually allows us to recover deleted data if the data has not been overwritten. So that's one of the key difference. Whereas when it comes to logical copy, we are not able to recover deleted data. And also allows us to collect secure credential storage, and we do not require SD card, and we are, we are actually able to analyze the so again, we actually can move next slide, please. So we actually use this uh, FS3 model uh, on a number of case study apps, Dropbox, OneDrive, Box, uh, OwnCloud, and so on. Again, we are actually able to recover a wide range of information, including the, the authentication tokens, and also pictures. And moving on, since I'm running short of time, I'm, I'm going to go through quite quickly. So a few months, I mean, one, I think one, one or two years, no, actually one, one year ago now, we were actually approached by one of by our stakeholders uh, in uh, police, in the federal police, because we actually work very closely with the federal, uh, with the law enforcement agencies in Australia. So they, was, they were wondering whether we, is it possible for us to come up with some sort of taxonomy, some sort of, uh, for, for, for lack of a better word, a cheat, a cheat sheet, where, okay, they say that we are, if you're going to investigate, uh, if this case involves, say, a social networking app, say WeChat or Tango, we want to know what our evidence we are able to, to recover, say from an Android device or from an iOS device. So what we do, did in this experiment, is, in this research, is we actually uh, study the 30 most popular Android communication apps and on the range of Android devices, and then we, we come up with a, with a taxonomy and say, okay, these are the type of information that you are actually able to recover from, Andro from these Android devices if they actually have these apps installed. So we actually categorize the type of information as well. So since then, we have also replicated the experiment on, extend the experiment to um, social networking apps as well as communication apps. So we are, we are, this is part of a bigger project. So we have um, so far conducted three, three different studies. Next one, please. And we also have um, conducted dating apps. I'm sure dating apps uh, will be somewhat the HD medicine case, I'm, I'm sure it will be fresh in some, some, some of our minds. So in this, in, in this, in this research, we actually uh, conducted a number of, um, we actually studied a number of popular apps, seven, de seven popular dating apps. Moving on to the next slide. And not surprisingly, we were actually able to recover a wide range of information from the device, including the messages and images that were sent from or received on from the device, the location of the user, and so on. I'm sure you do not need me to tell you that the information that users share on the dating app will be quite different in nature as compared I mean, when it comes to data that you share on other apps or other services, whether social networking or, or others. And also the images that you send on the dating app will be quite different from the images that you send on other apps, right? <laughs> in fact, <laughs> that's a good sign, I think. <laughs> so we found that we were actually reco able to recover a wide range of information. And also, we found that many of these apps, they actually use Facebook token. If you notice, on the last column, on the last column of the table, you have Facebook token, Facebook token, Facebook token. So many of these apps actually use Facebook token. And again, we were actually able to recover those Facebook token. So basically, once we recover, once we have accessed your device, we are able to recover your Facebook token as well as your, your, your information. So we'll be able to link out and know who you are. And, and I'm sure you, you realize that how damaging this information can be. The next slide, please. And our research actually caught the attention of media, which is not that common. <laughs> so I mean, the, the, I think our research was published at about the same time as the uh, incident involving HD medicine. I'm sure many of you actually have known about the HD medicine uh, incident where they are the, well, it's not a dating website, but let's call it a dating website for now. So it's a, it's, it's a dating website that actually got hacked and because of the because of the hack, a number of uh, there were actually a number of fiscal incidents where a number of uh, users on the website actually committed suicide, or they were actually they actually have to resign from their positions because they were in position of trust because of the hack. So all these cyber incident, cyber security incidents, they have real world implications. Next slide, please. And again, one or two years, I think one and a half years ago, we were actually approached by the federal police and said that look, we 
is it possible for us to be able to collect evidence from remote cloud servers if we do not uh, actually have access to the devices that contain, uh, they will actually use to assess the cloud services. Remember earlier I mentioned that in our client analysis, we actually were doing forensic investigation on client devices that have been used to assess the cloud services. Uh, what if we know that the, 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 the suspect or the user actually have this account, and, but we do not have a cooperation of a cloud service provider, can we still have a set, can we still be able to collect some sort of information from these um, services? So we actually come up with a, uh, this, this was actually a patent file. So we actually come up with a six step process for VM, VMware vCloud. So we, we demonstrate with a prototype that we were actually able to collect evidence, I mean, evidential data from VMware vCloud using this six step process. But one thing that, okay, when we actually present this back to our uh, stakeholders, they were interested, but when they present, when they actually discuss with their legal department, they said, well, this may be a gray area in the sense that, okay, let me give you a scenario. For example, if I'm a suspect, and one of you here is a law enforcement agency investigating me, but the services I'm using is for the based in the country in EU. And you say, you, because I'm, I'm a suspect, so you actually request my cooperation. I say, no, I'm not going to cooperate. In Australia, there is actually a penalty, there's actually a provision in the Criminal Code Act that if I fail to provide my username and password to an investigator, the, the, I'm, I'll be guilty of an offense, and the pe maximum penalty is two years. But the maximum penalty, say for example, a child porn investigation in Australia is 10 years. So two years versus 10 years is nothing, right? I'm sure you agree. And besides, being labeled a pedophile is not something that most of, most people want to, most criminals want to as well. So I, I refuse to cooperate. And for example, if you use my process, you manage to get my username and password. And you, using this process, you log into my account. And even though you don't have access to my help, to the computer that I have used to access the, 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 the services, you get access to my account, not the, 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 the data. The question is, is this process politically sound? Is this acceptable in the court of law? And if it's not, if the evidence is thrown out in the court of law, and if I'm released, I go back to wherever I come from, say uh, Singapore, China, or wherever, and I lodge a complaint against you, as the officer who actually, against the officer who actually assessed my account without my permission. So is the officer actually covered? He may be covered if he's still employed, I mean, by the police force, but what if he resigned and a few years later he decided to travel to the country for holidays? Will he be a wanted person? So this become a gray area. So that's, that's, that's something that I'm, I'll, I'll be quite interested in to explore to, to see whether that scenario actually applies to state Canada or other countries. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, we actually have filed a, we actually have filed a patent last year, uh, a, a, a patent, that's why I, I couldn't discuss much of a process. So we actually have a prototype for that. So in this patent, we, in this uh, patent application, we found that most of the forensic tools that require a forensically trained expert to actually conduct the investigation. But what we want to achieve in this is actually more of a push button forensics. So that any IT literate uh, practitioners can actually use our, 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 our software to actually collect evidence. For example, if there are three, this is a very basic uh, screenshot. So how we visualize in this system is we are actually able to, re re to actually collect evidence for a number of remote ho hosts. So remote hosts in this case can be 3D printer. So 3D printer or even um, some of the SCADA systems, say a, 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 system, a, a system that's sitting in the oil rig in the middle of the ocean. Anything that's internet connected, and once you are able, once you determine what type of uh, device you want to collect your evidence, and then you can you'll be able to enter your username and password. There are two versions that we actually want, want to roll out. So the first version is you have the username and password, and the second version is more to for the say the, net, the security committee is what if you do not have the username and password? Can you still be able to collect intelligence? So we don't call it data now, because whether we can actually uh, leverage some exploits to actually get into the system and collect the, the, the data for intelligent purposes, not for evidential purposes. So these are two different things. So once you have decided uh, to collect the evidence, and once we have done that, and then we can we'll be able to report. So these two basically covers the four, stage, four stages of um, the forensic in the sort of a push button approach. And coming to um, uh, big data, so one of the things that we found throughout our investigation uh, in the last five years is we found that the, the, when it comes to data, the volume of data, the number of uh, digital data sources, they are actually increasing exponentially. And can I move to the two slides? Yes, okay, thank you. So this is actually data from 
uh, SAPO, South Australian Police, where one of my PhD students is working. So we, that's why we actually have access to the data. And we found that when it comes to South Australian Police, so in Australia we have both the Federal Police and the State Police Forces. So this is just from the State Police Forces. And we found that if, just looking at uh, from 2006 to 2015, you find that this is actually an exponential growth. And this is only a selection of cases. So many of these, uh, many of the data are actually from say SD card, uh, external storage uh, iPhones, and some Android devices as well as Blackberries. The next slide, please. And again, um, this is the same statistics from them. And we found that in 2005, the number of mobile devices presented, I mean, the mobile devices that's part of the digital evidence is actually about 10%. But in 2014 calendar year, it's about 67% as compared to traditional hard disk. Five minutes, okay, thank you. So next slide, please. Okay, so again, uh, last year, no, two years ago, we actually, conduct, we actually reviewed uh, uh, literature in this, in this area when it comes to data reduction, triage, intelligent analysis, as well as any, any other related methodologies when it comes to forensic analysis, published in the last 15 years. We found that even in the last 15 years, because big data has only become um, a, a, a buzzword in the last couple of years, so, but some of the techniques that we are using for big data analytics have, have been around for a number of years now. So we actually researched publication in, in the last 15 years, and we found that there are a number of research gaps when it comes to both big data analytics as well as big forensic data. And we found that, that, I mean, when it comes to the various techniques, one of the potential techniques or one of the viable techniques is, is actually data reduction. And next slide, please. And in this work, we actually propose a, a this is actually a simplified version of a, we also, we, this is our second patent application which we found last year. So this is a simplified version, which I can show the full version, otherwise it's going to affect the, the, the claim. So this is actually the simplified version of the framework that we use. We actually have applied this uh, framework to sample data from South Australia Police, as well as the digital corpus data from uh, Naval Postgraduate School in US. Uh, they have a research data set of uh, forensic uh, forensic data set. And using this, this technique, we actually re re managed to achieve a significant data reduction uh, in, in terms of the data storage. The next slide, please. For example, these are, some of the studies, these are some of the studies. So in the first study, we managed to reduce the subset of the original data set from South Australia Police, this is a real world data set, to less than 1%, it's 0.196%. And also the research data set from US Naval Postgraduate School to Again, less than one percent, zero point seven five percent. This research has been published, and also in this research, in these two other research, which are which are currently under review, we also managed to re reduce the data set to more to less than one percent of the original data set. So what I'm trying to say here is, okay, one of the things that I need to clarify is, this doesn't replace the need to do forensic analysis, but this is a way to do a triage. For example, when it comes to big data, big data forensics, there are so much data out there. How do you determine in real time which are the things that I need to focus in, focus on? So what we are saying that using this, this technique, we are able to do a triage, but at the same time still be able to archive. I think that's actually some related to one of the videos that was shown earlier when it comes to archiving. We are still able to archive the data that we need for our subsequent investigation. So how much time do I have now? Two minutes, okay. Okay, some of the big forensic data challenges can be partly mitigated if we have forensic sound, forensic readiness built into systems. So many of us here will be familiar with uh, security by design. How many of us have heard of forensic by design or forensic readiness? Not many. So we, we actually started this research two years ago. Uh, there was actually uh, this, because last year, for the last six months, I mean, last year actually for, for the second half of my year, I was on sabbatical. So I spent some time with Interpol in Singapore. This is actually part of my project. With, with Interpol in Singapore. So we're actually interested in forensic by design and what does it mean? Because if you do a search for forensic by design, there are not many papers out there. In fact, I don't think there are, there are any. So when it comes to forensic by design or forensic readiness, so what we, what we want to say that, okay, there are currently there are, no, there are no systems that we are aware of that actually are, are designed with forensic ready, readiness in mind. So what does that mean? So when an incident happens, you know where to look for evidence and what type of evidence you'll be able to collect. How many of you are aware of such a system? I don't think there's any. So what we are proposing in this work is we should build systems from day one that are forensic ready. They are able to help us collect evidence in the point of, I mean, when, when, when there's a cybersecurity incident or when there's a, when there's a case of, when there's, there's something that needs investigation. So in this work, we actually propose a forensic, this is a high level conceptual framework for, okay. 
uh, for cyber physical cloud systems. So I only have one minute, so I'm just going to drop uh, skip. I'll be happy to have a chat later. And these are some of the challenges that we see from a uh, disciplinary perspective. Because big data forensic and big forensic data, in fact, the whole discipline of digital forensic is actually emerging. So there's a lot of things that we can do in this space. So for example, how do we actually, and as, as I think I mentioned in my one of my slides earlier, is digital forensic is interdisciplinary. So how do we actually integrate um, viewpoints and techniques from different disciplines into digital forensic to make it more scientific? So I'm, go I'm going to skip and yes. That's it from me to the last slide, please. Last. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. And sorry that I'm running through because I just realized I'm running short. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>